Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to be covering some of the basics on the introduction to grace and spiritual practice as taught by Swami Lakshmanju and Kashmir Shaivism. I wanted to introduce you to Denise and John Hughes and George Barcelar, who are going to be our presenters today, and want to welcome all of you for joining us. We're going to start off first by singing the Gora Mantra, which will have the words up on the screen for you to join us with. We'll be singing it three times. Sarvata Sharva Sarvibhyo Namaste Narubhivya Tagore Vyo Tagore Vyo Gore Tagore Tarivyasa Sarvata Sharva Sarvibhyo Namaste Narubhivya now Denise will be guiding us through a short meditation. Okay, this was the meditation that Swamiji taught us. It was, it was the last meditation, and he taught it to um, a large number of devotees. And so we wanted to share this with you. So please come into a comfortable seated pose. And let your eyes softly close. Start to become aware of your breath, both the inhale and the exhale of your breath. And follow your breath as it comes in, follow your breath as it goes out. Just smooth, easy breath, observing the breath. And now, together, we're going to add the, the pause after the exhale. So let's inhale the breath slowly. And then exhale the breath and let the breath all the way out. At the end of the exhale, observe the slight pause at the end of the exhale. And then inhale your breath. Exhale the breath. At the end of the exhale, observe the natural pause. And continue to breathe, inhaling at your own pace. Exhaling the breath fully. Take your time. And observing the pause after the exhale. And please continue observing your breath observing the pause after the exhale. Slow, smooth, easy breath. Observe the pause after the exhale. And continue with your breath.
Take a few more slow breaths here, watching the pause at the end of the exhale. Take two more complete breaths. And when you finish, just let your breath be free and observe your natural breath, your free breath. Follow your breath. Now allow your eyes to slowly open. So let's just first start off with introducing everyone that's here that will be a part of this series for the next four weeks. And I wanted to start off with um, George Barcelar, who's in Berkeley right now. Hi, George. Okay, hi. Um, do, you, do you have my audio? Is it okay? Yeah, you're nice and clear. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, welcome to this, uh, this webinar. This is quite... Uh, Quite a great moment to uh, to be talking about the subject of grace, which is a uh, very very uh, interesting subject on the spiritual path. But uh, my association with Kashmir Shaivism, or at least with the spiritual path, started uh, when I was quite young, when I was 18 or 19. I practiced uh, transcendental meditation for about 10 years. Um, had a, a close association with uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And I asked permission for him, could I go to India and study uh, more deeply? And he, uh, he gave me permission to go and I ended up uh, coming to see Swami Lakshman Jew. I was, uh, at that time, I met John and Denise. This was 1982-83. And I was fortunate that Swamiji ex accepted me into that small group, very small group of people that were studying with him. Uh, John and Denise had already been living in Kashmir for about uh, 10 years. Shana was about 11 years old. And uh, during that time, um, I, I got to not only work and, and be around Swamiji, but uh, had the opportunity to study this, this wonderful teaching, which was the main purpose that I, I went to Kashmir. And uh, since that time, uh, through my association with John, Denise, and Shana now, and also with uh, Viresh and with Claudia, we have been, uh, we've been working on all the recordings that were originally made, over, over 700 hours of recordings of Swamiji's lectures. And so far, we've published uh, 10, 10 volumes, 10 books. I think the books are in the background. There are 10 books on Kashmir Shaivism. Uh, and the, the lectures that we're going to be listening to during this uh, four-part webinar are from the original audio recordings of Swamiji talking about this subject of, of grace. So uh, um, I, can, I think I should hand it over to John and Denise to give a little bit of their background and uh, um, maybe John. Yes, good. Hi. Uh, welcome again. I, uh, I'm sitting here with Denise and... Uh, it is a, a real joy to have a chance to talk to everyone. And get, we've been thinking a long time about doing this, and so it's nice that we can do that now. Do it now. And uh, I started, I guess, in this lifetime, I started my physical journey on this on this path in 1969 when I was in Kashmir, India, with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, uh, learning to be a teacher of transcendental meditation. At that time, in he had gone, we had gone to Kashmir and because of the heat, and at that time he invited Swami Lakshmiji to lecture to us. I had never met, heard of him or what was going on at all. And, uh, and but uh, uh, having a chance to meet him and listen to him, I was really impressed with what he had to say. It was, uh, and his presence seemed to be really, really special. I, you know, just, just the vibe you had with the person. I, we'd been studying for a long time with Marshi already, and so we're kind of antsy to get back to, back to home because we've been this, 
out of her house for three, four months. But, but just to, that, this was our final thing to do was to be in, in Kashmir, and, and and it was such an honor to have that chance to meet Swami Lakshman Ju at that time. And then I came back to the United States and continued my studies. My area was a uh, history of religions, and I. I then moved to Canada to finish my doctorate, or to start my doctorate, actually, at McMaster University. And while I was there, they found that I had met Swami Lakshman Jew, and they recommended, because they, he had a very uh, supreme reputation in the, in the scholastic field as a, as a person who understood the teachings of Kazma Shaivism, because Kazma Shaivism was a, was a, is a hidden teaching, and it was, uh, although everybody knew that it was really something special, very few people knew much about it at all. And so, but they all knew that Swami Lakshman Jew was the really less living exponent and he was really very, very versed in it. And, uh, and, uh, and so they, they actually recommended that I go study with him, which is unusual because they usually want you to go study in a university under some kind of guidance. But they, they recommended and I, and I did. I, went to, I came to Kashmir with my wife and my daughter and, we, uh, and I sat at Swamiji's feet and um, Basically, the long ones, I asked him if he'd teach me Kashmir Shaivism, and he said he would be glad to. And so uh, he started his uh, uh, teaching with Denise and I. And part of that first teaching we have is, uh, which co is, comprises the book, Kashmir Shaivism, The Secret Supreme, are the lectures you're going to be, we're going to be discussing in this webinar uh, on, on grace. Because uh, he talked about many different subjects, and one subject he did cover very deeply it was was it, it was the thought of the, theory, the theory of grace and Kashmir Shaivism, and so that's why we're having this lecture. So we as, um, we stayed and studied there for 15 years, and then and uh, when we came back to the U.S., uh, uh, we decided we're working with George and Claudia and and and, and Shana and Varesh that uh, we would like to we were trying to make this teaching available to the world. That's what Swamiji asked me to do when, one of the last things uh, when I was leaving India. He said, you have to make my teaching live. So we came back to the West and we've been working on that, all of us. And we started off with George transcribing all these 600 hours of uh, audio, which is not a joke. And then, uh, and then we've been working on taking these audios. And what we've been doing is trying to make the, uh, re realizing that the master's voice is very important to have, to, to hear that, to hear the teaching. Uh, and so actually we wanted to emphasize the, the audio of the teaching and then have the, uh, the transcript available for a person to follow along and with annotations and comments and, and, and more in, in help in, in the transcript. And so the transcript is the books that we have published and that then in the back of the book, there's a free link to all the audio. So everybody can have the free audio for all the, all the work that we've done. And so that's where we are and we're continuing and. And uh, <laughs> we have a lot to do. We're trying our best, and uh, we still have a lot more to do. So I'll let you talk to Denise here. Okay. Well, um, I wasn't sure I wanted to go back to India after the first time. And so um, I'm very glad that I did with John. So it was really a pleasure to be there, to be in the ashram, to meet Swamiji. To, um, to hear the lectures that he delivered to us on um, Secret Supreme. And um, these, are, these were all concepts that I never had experienced or heard of before in my life. So it was all so new and fresh to me. John had been studying um, Indian studies for a number of years. And for me, it was just really an awakening, eye-opening, beautiful, beautiful experience. And Swamiji was so patient with us. And um, we have the transcript, the actual transcript of the, um, the book, Secret Supreme. And when I listen to it, it brings back so many fond memories, you know, of his kindness, of his care, of his wanting us to be comfortable and um, willing to teach us um, two or three times a week. It was... Um, he was, he was very gracious. And um, it was interesting that when we first went there, a uh, war broke out between Kashmir and um, Pakistan. And the Pakistanis were bombing. <laughs> they were bombing the airport in Srinagar. And um, it just 
all made me really nervous. But um, we kept going to the lectures, and so sometimes we would hear the planes above the um, the um, lecture hall. And Swamiji said, "Oh, they're the, they're the jets, you know. They're going to the airport to bomb some more, you know." And at one point, I thought I really need to go home because my daughter was only, you know, two years old, and and it was scary. And I thought we're right in the middle of a war, but we were also learning these amazing texts and and understandings. And um, so there was absolutely no way to leave, and so I just surrendered. <laughs> and um, I'm so glad that I did. It was just the golden days of our life. So my name is Shauna, Shauna Hughes. I am the daughter of John and Denise that used to be a baby in <laughs> Kathir. <Kaffir. laughs> and um, it was a really magical childhood because being raised in an environment and next to Swamiji, and, and the teachings and the, the philosophy and the idea that God is within all of us allowed my childhood mind to be able to expand in such a beautiful way where the idea of going to my Muslim friends next door and when we do namaz, I do namaz with them, God was there and the Catholic nuns at my school in Srinagar who wanted me to be Catholic with them would take me to go see Jesus in the church and God was there and we go to Swamiji to temples or do the puja or be a part of him and God was everywhere and it was it was such a such a gift, such a blessing to have that in my formative years and to bring with me when we came back to the States later on in my teen years. And so I feel so thankful to be a part of making sure that these teachings are available to the world and so I do the back behind the scenes work with Claudia, who we'll introduce right now, but um, we're really excited about sharing this next four part series because, you know, I, I get asked or I see on Facebook things about grace and Shakti Path. And so we want to share with you the understanding and teachings through Kashmir Shaivism. And so we look forward to you joining us over these next four weeks. And I just wanted to introduce you to Claudia, who is our wonderful tech web, intelligent, brilliant person. Artist. <laughs> Artist. I don't know. So my name is Claudia Dozo. I am George's partner. And uh, we met in 95 in India. I was traveling for a year on my own. And I've been since studying and practicing Kashmir Shaivism and Sanskrit and chanting and then started working with John, um, doing all sorts of things. Okay. Um, lately I've been doing, uh, I've been creating the website, the blog, and uh, maintained the social media platforms we have. And then Shana and I were really pushing everybody to do more webinars. And here we are. Um, I hope everybody enjoys it. I'm actually the one that messes up the audio in the back, so we'll try that again. <laughs> um, and making sure everything otherwise goes well, so. Yeah, no, I, I think the glitch and that, that little thing that happened is, is part of the sweetness of this webinar, so. Yeah, so we'll the, try again. <laughs> the question is, are we, ready, are we ready to play that now? Yeah, so George is, I mean, Claudia is gonna play that and put the transcript up. And then from there, we'll go into discussion. Back to work. This is the 16th in a series of lectures given at Swami Ishwar Sarupaji's ashram at 3 p.m. on August 12, 1972. Kashmir Shaivism is called Pure Trika system. Trika means threefold science of man and his world. You have to see in Trika's thought there are three energies, chief energy. Para, highest energy. Apara, lowest energy. 
and para para the energy combined and these three chief energies represent all threefold activities of the world hence it is admitted in this trika thought that this whole universe is existing in three energies in each and every action of the world it may be spiritual action it may be physical action it may be worldly action all these three energies are working it all behind. all at once they're all present together yes all present on different levels gross yes. subtle subtle yes. so subtlest is one energy gross is another energy gross energy and uh, combined is another energy second energy this trika thought is meant for human being to rise to universality without restriction of caste creed and color in this shaism in this path of shaism we have to we have to understand what is already in our um, view that is objective world objective world is to be understood this is prasiddham this is prasiddha this known throughout the whole system of trika trika philosophy trika philosophy teaches us to realize what is already in front of you you have not to realize what is not in front of you you have to realize this pencil this tape recorder this this to this money this specs you you have to realize it what it is actually to realize it actually is a sense of shaivism they have not realized god who is situated in uh, seventh heaven that is not to be realized you have to realize what is already before you thank you claudia Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. So using that excerpt, we're just going to discuss um, Kashmir Shaivism and the Trika philosophy. Yes, we are. And, uh, so let's get started here. And, uh, so I think the first thing is to, to talk about is uh, the word Kashmir Shaivism because uh, that's kind of what this thing, this whole thing, everything's wrapped around. And so let's, let's examine that and see what that means and, and how, how we understand that. Actually, the name Kashmir Shaivism was uh, given in the in the 20th century, in 1911, by Chatterjee, and it was part of the he was part, part of the group of scholars that was putting together the Kashmir series of texts and studies, which is um, the Maharaja Pratap Singh, uh, at the urging of uh, Swami Ram, had <coughs> had had uh, set these scholars you know, to work. Gathering all the t- texts of Kashmir Shaivism from everywhere because there was there's a lot of texts of Kashmir Shaivism but they were scattered here and there and and, uh, and Swami Ramid <laughs> was afraid that these texts were the way they were being lost they were just uh, uh, not being cared for and so forth and so he he uh, he, <laughs> he implored the, uh, the Maharaja to to with his emphasis and with his with his will to take charge of getting these texts uh, put, put together. So the Maharaja gathered a number of scholars together and then they began gathering the texts and, they, and these texts they are called the Kashmir, Kashmir series of texts and studies and that's where the name Kashmir came from. Kashmir Shaivism came from that series. And actually the Kashmir Shaivism is, is based on the, or actually is uh, the Trika system which we've just been hearing about a little bit. And it's a, it's a system of, It's a special uh, system in, our, in the Kashmir, and I mean, a special system in India because it's a it's a monism. It teaches it that, that uh, God and the man, God and the world are one. There's only one one reality, and there's not duality in this world. And uh, and so it's very special that way. Uh, I'm going to let George talk a little bit about Trika system here, and then we'll move on to something. Yeah, I I think it's important to understand. Um, For most people that get involved in, in a spiritual path or, you know, um, Eastern mysticism at least or Eastern spirituality, uh, if you go to India, the, the main thing that you're confronted with is, is Vedanta or some of these more um, 
you know, even Advaita Vedanta, which is uh, said to be a monism. And um, what a lot of people don't realize is that the, the, the tantric system, and tantra means expansion, an expansion of a path, expansion of knowledge. The system of Kashmir Shaivism, which is based on these ancient tantras, is, uh, is, uh, has just as much substantial uh, material uh, as far as ancient texts, which date back, you know, thousands of years. And uh, the, the uniqueness of, of Kashmir Shaivism, well, what was unique to me was that this is not a renunciate-based tradition. Most of the traditions, that, you know, they, they, they say renounce the world. You have to give up the world in order to achieve God consciousness or self-realization. But Kashmir Shaivism, as Swamiji just pointed out, that you have to actually realize what this world is. It's just the expansion and expression of this consciousness, which we call Shiva. And we go into the idea of Shiva and Shakti because they're never separate, but we'll talk about that a little later. But the, the, the wonderful idea that this is not a monistic, uh, this is not a, uh, sorry, a renunciate tradition, that this is a householder tradition in that sense. You can be a renunciate, but you don't have to give up the world. You don't have to wear anything special. You don't have to have an Indian name. You can just be exactly who you are because, as John was just pointing out, Swamiji has this great quote that, that uh, God and the individual are one and to realize this is the essence of Kashmir Shaivism. So uh, from that level, um, this, is, this is a really a, a tradition that, uh, that has, is still qu quite unknown, relatively unknown in the Western world. But uh, it's expanding slowly, as Swamiji said it would, and um, we're kind of happy to be able to present this to, uh, to you through this, uh, this webinar series. It's, uh, yes, it is. It's, uh, it's really special that way. I was thinking about this, you know, that uh, the, the fact that this teaching has been kind of hidden and uh, there's a lot of historical reasons why that happened, you know, the, 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 uh, the Mughal period and so forth in India was uh, a lot of pressure on on Kashmiris and, 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 and of, of other traditions. And so uh, a lot of these tradi traditions, uh, and particularly Kashmir Shahism, he kind of went underground. And so uh, you have the great teaching teachers of Kashmir Shahism, uh, uh, eighth, ninth, and 10th century of, 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 of Christian era, and then they, and then after that, there's, there's a big kind of like, yeah, a blank, you know, for for a thousand years or more. And then, and all of a sudden, yeah, it, at the beginning of this century, uh, I guess when the British came to India and so forth, that they, they started to come out of the from under the covers that we could say that is, and so, and so, uh, and the greatness of, for us is that um, uh, Swami Lakshmanju was a very well. He is an, actually he's a genius, and he was a, a very well educated in Sanskrit. He spoke Sanskrit fluently, and but he also spoke English. And his his family was a merchant family, and, and they're Brahmins, but they're a merchant family, and so uh, <clears throat> he knew a lot of uh, English. And so uh, the greatness for me as a student to go and study with him was that I could actually study with a person who uh, who could, could teach me in English, because most of the uh, traditional Indians did not speak English that way. And would, when he, like say Muktananda, for example, he did speak English. And so everything had to be translated. So it was a great boon for us because, you know, the thing about this tradition, it, it's, it's, a, it was hidden for, you know, those, uh, those thousand years, but actually even before that, there's a, a great uh, reservoir of, of uh, hidden tradition because it's a, it's a very powerful tradition and, uh, and it needs to be transferred actually from one master to the next orally. It's, 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 a, it's called an oral tradition. And that oral tradition is unbroken. It, it, it lasted all through these period, this period. And the, and, the, and the real essence of the secret of this tradition is in, the, is in that oral tradition. And our, our, our teacher, our master, Swami Lakshmiju, he, he had, was the last, and the last living exponent that we knew of that, that carried that oral tradition forward. And he had a full understanding and, and uh, an expression of this. And so that was a great, uh, great luck and fortune for the hum humankind, actually that uh, we had this teacher that had this extreme understanding that's a really powerful tradition because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so, uh, it's so en encompassing. Kashmir Shaivism is a, it's one of those traditions where when you study it, you go, wow, that's a, you know, that's all the questions are answered. It's, uh, 
anyway, uh, I go on and on about that. So let me get me back to George. Well, we were going to just first talk about, um, go into talking about monistic versus dualistic a little bit, and then go into some of the terms. Okay. Yeah, well, I think the monistic tradition um, basically means that, uh, you know, you, you, you understand this oneness of you uh, with, uh, with God. Uh, you know, and, and monisms are uh, presented in, in many different ways. Advaita Vedanta claims to be a monism, but there is a duality in, in Advaita Vedanta because the world is unreal. You know, neti neti. You know, you renounce the world and you realize the, the state of Brahman. But uh, for Shaivism, uh, Swamiji says that how can something unreal come out of something real? If Lord Shiva is real and Shakti is real, then how can how can something that is unreal come out of that? And for uh, for Shaivism, the other unique thing is is that that this uh, idea of ignorance ignorance is not some substance. It's not some dr the word in Kashmiri or the word in Sanskrit is dravya or dravyam. It's not some physical substance. Ignorance is simply. Uh, incomplete knowledge or lack of lack of fullness of knowledge. So, on a on a from a monistic point of view, um, then under the under the banner of Trika Shaivism, which is the which is the umbrella we could say under which the other there are the other systems within Kashmir Shaivism. Uh, all these systems come under that idea that there is only one supreme being, uh, which is Shiva and Shakti. Manifesting in these three energies, the supreme energy, medium, and, and inferior energies in the world, and that uh, the, the true realization is realizing that those energies, although they seem separate, are just one manifestation. They're the manifestation, and the word there is swatantriya. By freedom, by infinite freedom, uh, this whole universe has been created along all of us in it. So that's that, that's the monistic idea. Uh, a dualistic uh, traditions usually have some kind of ritualistic performance that's necessary, and Shaivism doesn't refute the value of these things. But you know, it says you can do puja, you can do whatever, you can you can go on pilgrimage, you can go to the temple, but you should see it in this idea of oneness. Like Shana, you said when you were a kid. You felt this oneness of God, no matter where you were at school or in the in the friends, uh, the Muslim friends' houses. So, um, but the the whole idea is is that it's not absolutely necessary to do some external thing in order to achieve something that's already inside you. So it's a consciousness-based uh, tradition. Yes, it is. It's a consciousness-based tradition, and the question is, for us, in in in, 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 in human beings. What is our what is our place in this world? What is our what is our what is the reality for a human being in this world? To uh, what is he to do? What are, what what should he be doing? And uh, and and that what is the highest goal for him? And and uh, the experience of great masters in all traditions is that uh, is that the uh, the oneness with their worship or oneness with the divine reality is really the aim of all being of all of all everything. And so that. And then that that oneness of that divine being that wishes in our Shaivism is oneness with that reality which is our own reality which is ourselves. So it's not like it's something other than us. It's a, it's the as, as George had said, it's a, it's the un, it's non fullness of knowledge. It's not empty non knowledge. It's non fullness. So that means that when you have full knowledge, that you realize you are that being. That's, that's the issue. But the but the interesting thing for us in this this lecture series effect is. Is how does that happen? What's the what's the mechanics of this uh, of coming to that realization of coming to that uh, that movement from from this state of, of of ignorance that we find ourselves in, uh, not knowing about it, or not even thinking about it, and not even wondering about it, to the state of uh, of of making that you know your whole life function, or maybe just having it where that your your whole life is filled with that reality uh, instantaneously as it happens with people, and so and so. That's that's actually what we say is the function of grace. You know, the grace, grace is that power of God that uh, lifts people up in, in 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 various ways. And we're going to find out that in our shives, and we talk about twenty-seven ways, about the the grace is this power of God that lifts people up, 
and, and, and puts them on the divine path. In fact, spirituality really is not possible without grace. Grace is really the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for having you know, a spiritual reality. And, and so uh, grace, is, we're going to find, is a, is a wonderful concept. And what's, what's really is special for us is that, is that something, the grace is not something you earn. Uh, our Shaivism does not teach, as many traditions do teach, that you have to earn grace. You know, you have to be a good person. You have to do this and that, and and uh, by doing certain things, you have <clears throat> reached that point where you have that you have the right number of merit points, and then grace will come. And that's, 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 and rather, it's a <clears throat> rather grace from our point of view is spontaneous uh, expression of God. That's a that's what George is talking about, this idea of Svetantriya, just God's expression. Why don't you speak a bit about this, George? Just. Okay, yeah, I, it, it's, it's, um, it's interesting that in Kashmir Shaivism, and, and in the first book that Swamiji did with, uh, with John and Denise, The Secret Supreme, he took, he took the main topics, and grace was one of those topics. And all of that book is, is, is basically the... Abhinavagupta, which is a name that will come up. Abhinavagupta was this great master who wrote this incredible encyclopedia of, of spirituality called the Tantra Loka. And Swamiji was so familiar with that text that he, uh, he encapsulated all of that in Secret Supreme. People have been after Tantra Loka for years in English translation, but it's all there in Secret Supreme, all the important philosophical teachings. But on grace, he, he clearly... He, he, he did it in a nutshell. He did it like a, almost like a tantrasara. He outlined nine different levels of grace. And those nine different levels of grace are broken up into three different sections. Grace that appears for the person who is, uh, has that uh, inferior level, grace for someone on the medium path of spirituality, and grace for somebody who is, is on a higher level. What I mean by lower or inferior, medium and higher it just means that we're all different. The whole universe is different. Lord Shiva has manifested himself in so many different ways. And um, the, on the inferior level, for instance, a person doesn't really think of God unless they're suffering. But that suffering sometimes brings them to the thought of God. So that, that in itself is grace opening up. On the medium level, it's somebody who's actually really um, excited. They, they find a book or they find it and they say, I've got to go to a teacher. I've got to find someone to teach me this. I've got to learn something. And, and on the medium level, they usually end up at the feet of a, uh, a, a teacher, a spiritual teacher. And there can be many varying degrees of which teacher they come to. So it might be they go from one teacher to the next, to the next, to the next, and finally find the teacher that suits them. This is also a sign of grace, something opening up in their life that, that they want to follow, pursue a spiritual path. On the higher level, the more advanced, what we could say, the more advanced uh, practitioner <laughs> finds that grace can often just descend uh, very spontaneously. And it, there was nothing that they did in the beginning or appears to be nothing they did in the beginning. And this is not just... Uh, this is not just in Kashmir Shaivism. If you look into all of the different traditions and in Christianity and all of these different mystical traditions, you will find there are saints who had this spontaneous awakening without any, any precondition that it would come. St. Thomas Aquinas in the Christian religion, you know, his life was just all upside down and then all of a sudden grace descended upon him. Uh, there, are, there are so many examples of this and uh, this is what we go into in, in this course, not into the, these three, these nine can be divided up into 27, actually. Each one has three different avenues. But the grace, um, the, interestingly, grace is, is directly proportional to how much time and energy and space you're, you're giving in your life to your spiritual endeavor, you know, to your spiritual practice or to your, your spiritual study. So this is the idea of grace, that grace is a spontaneous thing and it comes from within. You know, it comes from within you and it opens up something in your heart and your mind, you know. And Denise has a, has a good one. What did you said to Swamiji once, Denise, about grace? I asked him if um, grace comes from above. He goes, it also comes from the sides and down below it comes from everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
give us some ideas what you have on grace, Denise. Just say something. There's different intensities of grace, just like you were talking about, you know. And, um, and the more intense, you know, the more um, you get carried into that state of, um, you know, of God, of intensity of God. And um, I had this dream when we first went to Kashmir, it was in see, 1971 or two or something. And I was in the kitchen and um, I was cooking and I was just thinking about the last lecture Swamiji gave us. I think it was on grace or something. And then that night when I went to sleep, um, I had a dream about Swamiji's ashram and about Swamiji. And um, when we would go for lectures, we would see his house and he lived, he lived on the first story. And, um, and right above his room, there was this glass um, top, you know, it, was, it had panes and it went all the way around and it was just like a cap on top of the roof. And I, so I dreamed that Swamiji would go up there and he would, he would sit and um, there was a, a desk that went all the way around and all these different levers. And what he was doing is for each of his devotees, he was pulling the lever a different intensity. And then he'd go to the next one. <laughs> oh, that's what he does up there. <laughs> I don't even know if I, <laughs> if I ever even told him that, but it was just so beautiful. I went, okay, that's where it's coming from. That's where the grace is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> It makes it so powerful that once you once you have uh, once you uh, that, <clears throat> that grace uh, strikes strikes you. You know, once you're lifted with that grace, you're filled with that grace. It's like that's really the meaning of Shaktipata, that the descent of that descent of that the power of that spiritual power. That uh, when that lifts you or fills you, that just depending on that grace. You're, you're just carried to that. You can't help it. It's not like you can uh, not have to do that. It's, uh, all of a sudden you start thinking about uh, the divine uh, in different ways, depending on, the, the, as you say, the strength of that grace. Some people, they can't, they can't, they get carried away where they just, they think about God all the time. You know, I mean, that's their, their day is filled with that. And some people think about God every now and then, you know, but they, but they definitely, it just comes to their mind. I mean, why do they think they just, this the, the divine thought that comes from them, and they and this this is the nature of grace. That once you once God shines that within you, that uh, and you is irresistible. That's the thing about grace. It's not, that's yeah, I, just, I'll just add a little because I you know grace is always. I think it's a question on everybody's lips. You know, do I have grace, and what can I do to get more grace? Um, and and. The Swamiji says that, you know, grace is all around you. Uh, often we're looking in the wrong places. You know, we're looking for the glasses that we're already wearing is a, the great analogy of grace. But um, I never found any teachings, and, and I had studied quite a bit of, of Indian philosophy, but I'd never found anything that, that went into such a specific details of just the different levels of grace. Like, for instance, in the, in the medium level of grace, there are there are there are different types of aspirants. There are some aspirants that they want they want to achieve uh, self-realization, but they also enjoy living in the world. They don't want to give up the world, and they when they meet a, a, a fully realized master, that master can see exactly what that person needs, and he may initiate them, and they it can even get realization. But in order to fulfill the other side of that equation. Their worldly, I think, he, Swamiji tells us that through the teachings of Kashmir Shaivism that when that person dies, they're sent off to a particular heaven where they enjoy wholeheartedly all the uh, worldly pleasures that they couldn't enjoy fully on earth because earth has its limitations. But he says in the heavenly abodes, they enjoy to their heart's content until they're fully, fully satisfied, fully satiated, and then that self-realization of consciousness being behind all of this, that the bliss behind all of these worldly pleasures comes forth, and they, they uh, have complete realization. So it goes into minute details, and some people go to the heavens, and he says they have to come back to earth because they still haven't fully 
satisfied that those worldly desires. And I never read anything that was that went into such uh, you know intimate detail uh, about those uh, those different levels, different grades of grace. That again, all happen spontaneously, depending upon the capacity of the of the uh, individual. Ken, Ken, oh, I'm sorry. Once Swamiji said that this first sign that you have grace is that you develop love and devotion for Lord Shiva, for God. Yeah, in whichever tradition you are, love and devotion. Yeah. Shana. I just wanted, um, as looking at the time and everything, I just wanted um, to discuss a couple of the terms so that we prepare ourselves for when we start the four-part series next week. And the few things that we'd um, plan to discuss and just go over are um, the difference between Shiva and Shakti, or not the difference, right? And then also over the five great acts. So if we could discuss those two, so those two terms come up again and again, Shiva and Shakti, so for people to have a, a, a clear understanding. Okay, I'll start, I'll try, I'll uh, talk about Shiva and Shakti, and George can talk about the five great acts, I like that. Um, <laughs> Shiva is, uh, Shiva is the uh, is the ground of being. It's the, he, he's uh, uh, we speak about that in the sense of the male, but he he's the, he's that reality which is he is the ground of everything. In our, from our point of view, he's he's the uh, <coughs> essence of all that is, and there's nothing uh, that's not 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 Shiva. And uh, in the West, we would that they would just be he would be God. That would be the word God for him. Uh, the word Shiva really means auspicious or or uh, offering really uh, help and uh, being uh, wonderful that way to a person. It's, uh, <clears throat> but it, it, it defines uh, that reality. Now, many people, the, uh, they have Shiva for them is a, is a, is a, divine, a divine being. You know, they, they have a, he has a form and he carries a dunda and he has a certain... Uh, Form about him. There are books written about them and him and so forth. Uh, our Shaivism doesn't. Uh, our Shaivism doesn't reject that. But our Shaivism uh, takes take the understanding of Shiva to be uh, as the whole the whole of this word, the whole of this reality. That's the nature of, one, of oneness and the nature of harmonism. That, that everything is Shiva, and uh, and the other aspect of that is that Shakti is his energy, and uh, his energy is. His, he expands his energy in the world, and that's what, what the world is. And that energy is a, it's a living energy. It's not a dead energy. It's a living energy, and it, and it, and it fills everything. And that energy is, a, is a, it's that energy, of, uh, the energy of grace, which we talked about, that Chakipata and, and that and, and that Agora Mantra, that those three uh, aspects of the Agora Mantra, which we're going to talk about more in the, in, in the, in the course, those three aspects, you know, are... Uh, um, are inferior, medium, and supreme, and but basically, it's that supreme energy of of, of Agora that is the energy energy of grace, and so this these energies that that make up the world, everything is really just an energy expression of God as an energy. I mean, uh, and that those energies are all just one with one with Lord Shiva. They're not separate from Him. They're uh, uh, just uh, almost like a, two sides of a coin. They're just. Uh, you can't, you can't separate the energy from the, the energy holder, like a flame and the heat and the heat of the flame. Those kinds of things are just absolutely one. But but the thing is that the, that uh, the conscious uh, Shiva's consciousness and Shakti's the uh, the Vimarsha, the knower of that consciousness. So, yep. And they're never separate. Never separate. Shakti always intertwined. And also the the reason it's called Shakti Pata. Is it's not called Shiva Pata. <laughs> this is the important thing to understand too. That that Shakti Pata means that it's through Shakti, through this feminine energy, which is uh, it, it is so ingrained in Shiva. That it's through that energy that you can rise to the level of that consciousness of Shiva, that understanding of of that internal state. And so Shakti Pata, which is which is grace, which is Anugraha, and uh, it, Swamiji, at the beginning of this uh, next talk, we're going to talk, he talks about five different levels of, of action of Lord Shiva and Shakti together. And that is that, that they create, maintain and destroy. And that's the, that's the lower levels. 
but there is a concealing and revealing. So the concealing is that Lord Shiva and Shakti together through this expansion have concealed themselves, not only in us, but in all the things around us. They've concealed themselves because this whole room, everything is made of consciousness. It's also, and it's made of energy. So it's concealed, but the revealing or the anugraha is when that consciousness reveals itself in these things as the underlying principle of all. So those five qualities are talked about creation, maintenance, destruction, concealing and revealing are the five energies of, of Lord Shiva. Nice. And we'll talk more about that also. That's an important point. Right. And we'll also talk about the difference between Shastipat and Anugraha and many other um, important explanations and also stories to go along with it. And also making this so that it is um, not just where we understand what these graces are, but also to make it more relatable into our day-to-day -day lives. And through the practices, mom will be teaching Denise on um, meditation and um, chanting with us with the mantra and the different explanations and hearing Swamiji's voice. It just really threads and comes together so beautifully. So I, I would love for George to end this um, webinar today with a story. And, and then um, we look forward to seeing all of you next Sunday. Same time, same place, all of that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you a short story relating to grace, which I, I, I saw on many occasions around Swami Lakshman Ju. Uh, on one occasion, a scholar had come to, uh, to ask some questions of Swamiji, and uh, he'd come along with his girlfriend. And, uh, but they came in the morning, and Swamiji wasn't there. And I said, look, I, I, it's not a day where he usually meets the public, but since you're asking about Kashmir Shaivism, and that's his subject, that's what Swamiji is living for, I'm sure he'll meet with you, come back in the afternoon about four o'clock. And this uh, scholar's girlfriend sort of went, yes, let's go. Let's, let's enjoy Kashmir. Let's go shopping. Let's enjoy the scenery. Kashmir is very beautiful. Everybody knows that. So Swamiji came and I told him and he said, yes, yes, I'll meet them. And at, uh, at four o'clock, they came back looking fairly, you know, like, wasted and they'd been traveling around and they went and sat in the pavilion with Swamiji and his girlfriend sat off to the side and she was not interested in what the questions were and uh, then he started asking his questions but his accent was so broad Swamiji asked me he said please interpret what he's saying I, he's been talking to me for five minutes and I can't understand so uh, it, he had a Scottish accent or something like that it was very difficult for Swamiji so here I was, I was interested in these questions. Me and the scholar have got our heads buried in these papers and books. And we're formulating a question. And all of a sudden, Swamiji says, why is there moisture? Why is there water in your eyes? We both look up and we looked across at his girlfriend and she was just sitting there looking up at Swamiji and just tears just streaming down her face. And in that instant, she said, it's, it's just so peaceful here. My heart is expanding so much. I, I can't stand it. She said, and she didn't take her eyes off Swamiji. He reached in his pocket. He gave her a clean handkerchief and she blew her nose. And then she was about to hand it back. And Swamiji said, no, 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 you can keep that one. <laughs> and, and to me, that was the, that was the complete expression of somebody that wasn't expecting anything, but got this grace of, of peace. And, and, and it really, you can see, it really had such a profound effect. So yeah. grace can come at any moment, especially when you're sitting in the presence of an enlightened being. Right. Thank you, George. That was just beautiful. There oh. was. Dad, what were you going to say before no. we say goodbye no, and no, jive with them? This is the came that she wasn't expecting that she was a, she wasn't not on the spiritual path from her point of view at all. She was just taking it along in a, in a, in a, on a shopping trip, as it were. And all of a sudden, boom, she got there. <laughs> she you know, got touched. She got touched. Ooh, yeah. to be touched. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you all. And thank you all for joining us. And we will be answering questions starting next week. We were just figuring out the technology part. And, um, and we'll choose some questions and answer them weekly. And we'll come together as a group. And we hope you all join us. Yes. yes. So thank you all. Jai Gurudev. Jai Gurudev. Jai Gurudev.